I would like to speak now a, a little bit about one of the texts that many of you are studying, the Apology. First, I want to be sure that all of you understand the meaning of the title, Apology, in, in this uh, context. Uh, it comes from the ancient Greek word, apologia, which means defense. So apology here does not mean, as it does in common English usage now, an admission of guilt or wrongdoing, quite the contrary. Now, why is Socrates on trial? There are two formal or official charges that are made against him, that his accusers bring forward. The first is that he does not believe in the gods in whom the city believes, but in other divine beings or other divinities. And the second, that he corrupts the young. Socrates argues, however, that these formal charges or official charges are in fact based on or rooted in two older charges that have long been held against him. That he is, as he says, a student of all things in the sky and below the earth. And that he makes the weaker argument the stronger. Now, what, what does this mean? What would this entail? In regards to the first charge, not believing in the city's gods, Socrates says that what he really is being accused of isn't simply that, which implies a kind of impiety or heresy, uh, but rather atheism. So uh, what is meant by saying that he studies what is above and below the earth implies atheism. Such activity was associated with a group of earlier philosophers, whom we now call simply the pre-Socratics, who were, we might say, uh, proto-scientists. or They were seeking to explain natural events or natural phenomena by reference to some kind of established order, a natural order or necessity, rather than the willful action of divine beings, gods. So for example, they might attempt to explain the sun's seeming rotation around the earth in what we would call scientific terms, rather than attributing the sun's movement to the will and actions of a divine being. So insofar as these, philo these philosophers denied that natural events were caused by the action of the gods, they were believed to be atheists. And that's what Socrates here is, is saying that he's associated with. Now, in regards to the second charge, corrupting the young, Socrates argues that he is not, in fact, being charged simply with corrupting the young, but with, as he says, making the weaker argument the stronger, and thereby corrupting everyone, corrupting society as a whole. Now, what does this mean to say? What does he mean in saying, making the weaker argument appear the stronger? It means that he's being accused of undermining traditional morality. He's accused of undermining socially held beliefs about what is right or what is just. That would be the stronger argument, okay? And in fact, arguing in favor of something that's, that's held socially to be wrong or unjust, that's the weaker argument. So this would mean, as just as an example, uh, he could employ speech that would undermine arguments in support of private property and instead argue and argue convincingly, argue persuasively in favor of stealing. So anyone, according to Socrates, uh, or excuse me, so according to Socrates, what he's really being charged with is not simply corrupting the young, but corrupting everyone, wholly undermining, being able to undermine conventional morality, and thereby corrupting society as a whole. Now I leave it to each of you in your classes to ponder whether teaching atheism 
and undermining conventional morality are truly crimes, and whether Socrates ade adequately defends himself against these charges. There is one more issue from the Apology that I would like to mention, and it's in reference to what is probably the most famous line of that whole text, Socrates' statement that the unexamined life is not worth living. Now, what does this mean? Let's consider it in the context in which Socrates says it. It's near the end of the speech. He's already been found guilty. And at this point, the jury must decide what the punishment will be. His main accuser has proposed as punishment death. Socrates knows that he is on trial because of his words, because of his teaching. He knows if he tells the jury that he's sorry, he didn't mean to offend anyone, I'll just leave now and I'll shut up, okay, that he could very likely be let off without much in way of punishment. But he doesn't say that. Instead, he says he would rather not live he would rather face death than stop talking. It's through talking, conversing, discussion, sharing opinions that we examine ourselves. And Socrates is saying that this is more important than anything else. So important, in fact, that to live without it would be to remove what is most valuable in life and hence it would be better to die. Let me now speak a little about the allegory of the cave. And first, let's just recall some of the main elements of the cave. The prisoners chained in an underground cave. There's a wall behind them, right? And, and, and there's a fire behind them, and there are objects being held, and the shadows of those objects appear in front of them, on the wall in front of them. And so from their perspective, what they see is the wall in front of them, which is really shadows that are themselves uh, representations of something else, right? what's above. But they think that everything in front of them is all that there is. That's it. And they try to name it, to define it, to give it a kind of ultimate meaning. Now there's a prisoner who leaves, and I would ask you to notice uh, in the text uh, the word that, that's used in this context is compelled. The, the prisoner, a prisoner is compelled to leave. He doesn't decide to leave, he's compelled to leave. So this raises the question, can anyone leave the cave willingly? Must the freedom that comes with understanding begin with a kind of compulsion where one is pushed or perhaps pulled to go beyond the place one, one is now in? So the road to understanding begins in confusion and in a kind of compulsion. It involves the loss of security of one's beliefs. And at least for the time being, those beliefs cannot be replaced by others. Now the prisoner ascends, okay, goes up, but this is a painful process, right, that the escaped prisoner goes through. Uh, Socrates likens especially the pain of, or the discomfort of gaining in knowledge or gaining in wisdom to the pain or the discomfort we can experience when we enter into a room that's very light, right? Light is like knowledge or enlightenment. If we are in the dark, we are unenlightened. We go into a, light, a very, very bright place. Initially, our, we seem to be blind, right? It takes a while for the eyes to adjust. Okay, so when the prisoner, as the prisoner ascends, he, can't, he, he, he can only slowly begin to look at things particularly the more light there is in those things. He starts with shadows. Shadows, even once he has escaped the cave, and he's above, he's, 
in the, in the world that we know. He, he starts with shadows, and only slowly and with effort can he look at things themselves. Okay? Now, finally, we're told he's able to look at the sun, the source of light. Okay, then the, 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 the story changes, and the prisoner descends, goes back down. Now, the question uh, is, is raised, why? Why does he return to the cave? Well, he's certainly not a zealous crusader, but he feels pity. He pities those still there, and he wishes, or he would like to move them, if he could, to have the same experience that he has had, despite how painful it's been. So at this point, he realizes it's worthwhile. Now, what is their response to him? What is the response of the prisoners in the cave? They think he's been harmed that he's lost his sight due to his experience. Why don't they believe him? Do they have any frame of reference by which they could even understand him? Must one not go through something like the freed prisoner did in order to gain understanding? To the people in the cave, the freed prisoner left sighted but he's come back blind. So from their perspective, to do what he did would be terrible. Hence, they respond by forbidding him to speak, and they even threaten him or anyone who says or does what he has done with death. Now, what is Socrates suggesting about the nature of learning through this allegory? Let me mention a few things that I at least to get out of it. The first is that those who seek truth, those who seek knowledge, those who seek wisdom, must proceed slowly and with effort. Socrates emphasizes how difficult it is to gain knowledge, right? The eyes take time to adjust to the greater light, and it's painful. It even seems to be, initially, a descent rather than an ascent. That is, from the point of view of the learner, the freed prisoner, initially he seems to be worse off than he was as a chained prisoner. He seems to be, you might say, regressing rather than progressing. Have you ever had an experience like this? Do you think that your education at TLU might at times be like this? Second, education takes you from one place and brings you to another, and there is no going back. You will be radically transformed. This also can be painful. It might even lead you to become estranged from those you care about, from family members, friends back home, as the freed prisoner was estranged from those remaining in the cave. Third, education, the quest for truth, might at times be unpleasant and even perilous. If you challenge those still in the cave, what happened to Socrates might happen to you. Perhaps not as dramatically, I, I doubt that you'll be tried and executed, but you might be rejected. You might be socially ostracized. And this certainly can be painful. Hence, my final word to you, use caution. There is danger ahead. Danger, but also, I hope, the satisfaction that comes from seeing the sun, even if it's just a small and momentary glimmer of it. Thank you.